to fulfil my commitment. Does that actually entail? Uh, basically, uh, it involves everything that uh, affects the on-air sound, uh, which uh, is mainly the guys, what they say, how they say it, how they present uh, the things that they're saying, how they present the music. Um, I select all the music, flashbacks and, uh, and current music. Uh, it controls just in what proportion we play that music, how many flashbacks and how many new ones and the rotations, whether we play one record a lot or we don't play it quite so much. Uh, just really everything that controls the on-air sound, if, uh, it's what people hear and if something is uh, affecting that, then it's, uh, it's my duty. If, if, it's, uh, if it's not sounding the way we want it or if, it, if it's wrong, then it's my job to, to fix it. What are some of the other facets or uh, areas? For album cuts, you're only lifting four or five tracks, so you have to be uh, very selective. And a lot of it is how you feel yourself, whether you think something will fit into the format this week to give you an overall sound balance. Um, the overriding fact, of course, is whether people are going to like it, which is something that uh, I guess any programmer gets paid to basically know, although you're never going to be right. I mean, you can turn around and... I'm. I'm there's records you, you really think are going to be hits and you put them on the playlist, sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. And then there's other records you hear and you think, oh, that'll never sell. And it'll be huge. I mean, nobody's ever been 100% right. If, if you could be, you'd be worth a million to the recording industry. But uh, it's a long process. It takes about a day to do a playlist. You've just got to sit there for five or six hours and, uh, and try and balance it and, and get it right so that you're giving people what they want to hear. How important is it for a radio station to have a format? Oh, I think it's it's essential now. The old days, um, when I first went into radio, really anything happened at all. Guys, guys ran wild. Do you want to edit? How important is a format in a radio station? I think uh, right now formats are very important. Once upon a time, uh, radio was very loose. The, every guy on air did what he wanted to do. He brought in his own pile of records and talk to the people he wanted to, to talk to and if he didn't really want to play music he could do something else and there was no real structure to radio but over the last four or five years in particular radio has become uh, very competitive and a lot more professional in its outlook. I think it's uh, important to note uh, if one was to look at this area um, people here if they want to can listen to Melbourne stations there are also other stations in this area. Although they may not be direct competition, they are in fact an alternative. So from a programming point of view, if you give a, a guy an album and say, play what you like, nine times out of 10, the guy will pick the one track that you'd never play, it'd be awful. And it, it, it happens time and time again. So you've got to format your station down. Uh, initially, you've got to decide just what audience you want for your station or what audience you'd like to have listening to your station. Uh, be reasonably specific about it and then program tightly and that's not just music, that's the overall thing, sport, news, local in involvement, interviews in selected areas and so on. And you decide just what you're going to do in each of these areas to attract the audience that you're after. So the format thing is, is very, very important. In regards to announcers, what do you expect of announcers here at this particular station? To be able to do everything that they're asked to. Um, it's, it's very difficult. I, I think we're very fortunate at the moment. We have a lineup that uh, I can honestly say I think we've got the best lineup of voices, radio voices, in provincial Australia. And it's taken us a while to find it. It's very, uh, one of the great problems is not a lot of talent around at the moment. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, but the guys have to be able to fit into any shift. They have to be able to do production, uh, go out and meet people, conduct interviews. They're probably called on in provincial radio to do a lot more than they would be in, in city radio where they, they can specialise and if they're just going to do breakfast or a women's shift or a nighttime shift, that's all they do and they don't have to do very much else at all. But here the guys have to be interchangeable when somebody goes on holidays and necessitates perhaps a shift change. And... Uh, Basically, the problem is the guys have to be able to do everything. Okay, we'll of announcers. We get phone calls from people asking us some of the most outrageous questions, which we, which nobody could possibly even uh, be expected to understand. Could you give us an example? Well, I can actually. A station which we 
which we had, which I once worked at in Western Australia. We had a religious program by a fellow called Garner Ted Armstrong. Now, one fellow rang up and he said, we've got a bet on the Garner Ted Armstrong that does the, uh, the program. Wasn't he the fellow who was the first man on the moon? And, um, well, we said, no, 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 that was Neil Armstrong. Oh, but didn't he, didn't he become uh, a man of God? Uh, yes, he did. Are you certain it's not him? Oh, we're quite certain. Oh, well, I've just lost $50. Um, they do expect us to know, know these things. And um, occasionally, when I worked a Saturday, we got phone calls from people saying, um, can you remember who won the Melbourne Cup in 1951? Well, I wasn't born in 1951, and I don't, really don't follow horses, but they do sometimes expect you to know. Do you enjoy... Alan, do you want to specialise in any particular field in regards to announcing, or would you like to do what you're doing at the moment, a general uh, pricey of uh, announcing? Well, at the moment, with breakfast, and I'm just new here in Shep. Um, with, with, with breakfast, I'd like to put a little bit more um, human interest and comedy into it, which is basically what I'd like to specialise in, into things which people can identify with, um, along with uh, things comedy because I think there's a great need for good comedy writers and performers here in Australia. But for the, uh, for the present I'll stick with what I'm doing. I think I'm young enough to uh, stick at it for long enough and in time I think I can specialise but as you grow older so, so do your um, ambitions grow older and they change but for the moment I'll be happy sitting where I am early in the morning behind the microphone greeting people as they get out of bed. I love Shepparton. Kevin, back in about 1942, uh, this is when a decision was made to uh, improve the overseas coverage from what was then known as Australia Calling. And of course, during that time, during the Second World War, a site was required that was away from the major capital cities, but was near a big provincial city. And it was, of course, had to be flat because of our radio signal uh, transmission. And indeed, also, it was there to support our troops in the field during Second World War to provide something for them to listen to and to be aware of what was happening. Well, could you explain to us what's happening at the moment as we can see one of the supervisors in operation? At the moment you see the, uh, the control room, which is the basic central control point on the station here. This operator has uh, control over the 10 different transmitters, that is the 10 different radio stations all in the one building. And he can control the program content of what's going in he can supervise the voltages and currents occurring on the transmitters and determine whether everything's working correctly. And he can uh, be sure that the aerials are connected right to his particular transmitter that he's watching and be sure the program's going out the way we'd like it to. Well, moving on further, we're going into the storage room where all the valves are kept. Gee, they're enormous size. Yes, there's a lot of them too, Kevin, and uh, they cost a lot of money. Those valves, of course, we have to bring in from overseas. Uh, and they're the basic heart of any transmitter. They're the, the, uh, the tube that generates the radio signal. And of course they're very expensive and we have large quantities of them. And so we keep them for replacement. We use, uh, in some cases, perhaps four a year for some transmitters and lesser quantities in others. But we're looking at some very large transmitting valves you won't see anywhere else. And onto the aerial transmitter. The aerial matrix switch. Um, well, that, Kevin, as uh, we talked about, was used for connecting uh, our antennas to any one of the transmitters we have. Now, as you can appreciate, if we are sending signals to different countries around the world, then we need many different antennas that face to that country we're sending our signals to. And so we've got approximately 36 aerials, Kevin, and this switch here enables us to make a connection between any one of those antennas or aerial to any one of the 10 transmitters and uh, that enables us to remote control the switch from inside the building and during the day and night we're able to make selections of these aerials. 